Four priests went to see the new summer blockbuster at the movie theater. It was a day off, so they were in civilian clothes, no collars. Bought their tickets, got their popcorn, found their seats, and sat together in the fifth row. Before the movie started, the theater manager came to the priest on the end. Excuse me, Father, we don't charge priests for movies here. Here's your money back. So predictably, the priest's three friends said in unison, we're all priests. The manager went back. He went to the box office, returned with refunds, and a man-of-the-cloth free movie pass for each of the priests. After the movie was over, the priest, the first one on the end, said to the manager, Thank you for the passes, but I have to ask, how did you know I was a priest? Was it the way I spoke? Was it my smile? What? And the manager said, Father, it was easy. When you came down the aisle and found your seat, you genuflected. (laughs) Look around the church. Everybody under the age of 25 is going, is that supposed to be funny? What's he talking about? (laughs) Friends, there was a time when everyone entering a Catholic church would genuflect. It was an involuntary habit for every churchgoer. The reason for why we genuflect is demonstrated in today's gospel. The healed man runs to Jesus, and like a priest in a movie theater, the leper takes a knee. The man has rightly recognized the presence of God in Jesus Christ. And so, he kneels before him and worships. But pay attention to how Jesus describes him. He says that the man returns out of gratitude. Has none but this Samaritan come to give thanks to God? That's it. The word in the original language for the phrase to give thanks is familiar to all of us. To give thanks is actually the word that we use to name the most important thing we do every week here at church. The word for to give thanks is Eucharist. Bet you didn't know you knew how to speak Greek, did you? So why the custom of genuflecting when we come into church? Why go down on a knee when we pass in front of a tabernacle? It's simple. That gesture represents our intellectual accord with the idea that the treasure kept in that tabernacle is not mere bread, but the bread of life. It's not ordinary food, but the food of angels. It's not just something nourishing, alleviating hunger for a moment, but nourishment to satisfy us unto eternity. Thoughtful genuflection shows humility and reverence to the body of Christ here in our church. Because surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. But how can we say that? How can we Catholics be so confident in claiming that during the consecration of our Mass, simple bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ? still looks like bread, still tastes like wine. If I see bread and wine with my own two eyes, why should I question it? Here's why. Father Brian Gerber and I were driving back to Marygrove from Escanaba after dinner. This was a good 10 years ago when Father Brian and I were both assigned to the retreat house. We were heading up US 2, a few miles this side of Max Bar, And I looked into my rearview mirror, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I said, Brian, quick, look out the back window. The sun is crashing into the highway. I kid you not, that's exactly what I saw. The sun had plummeted to the earth, slowly crashing into the middle of the highway in Rapid River, a few miles behind us. 
Okay, now we all know that the sun did not crash in Rapid River 10 years ago. But that's what I saw. Father Brian, too. Scientists tell us that the sun is 864,400 miles across. That's about 109 times larger than the earth. So there's no way a giant star like that could, could crash into a planet so tiny. What really happened? Any psychologist could tell you that it was our perspective that affected our perception. On that day, at that precise time, from our vantage point on US2, the movement of the planets inched along so that the sun was disappearing beyond the horizon as the earth rotated Father Brian and me out of view. It was no more than a perfectly timed sunset. But Father Brian and me, we saw the sun crash with our own eyes. Two men, both with clear vision, both educated, one marginally intelligent. You figure out which one. What we saw looked like one thing, but it really was something completely different. No problem. We're sensible people who have learned that appearances are not always accurate. Though normally reliable, our eyes deceived us. So what do we do? We rely on the testimony of experts, scientists, astronomers, psychologists. Those experts easily explain how Father Brian and my eyes misled us that day. Here's the lesson. Reality is not reducible to appearances. At times, the deepest truth of things is revealed not through what we see, but what through we but through what we hear, through the testimony of the one who knows the truth. In a few minutes, brothers and sisters, bread and wine will be brought forward and placed on the altar. With a few sacred words, the power of God will transform them into the body and blood of Christ. Will it still look like bread and taste like wine? Yes. The appearances will not change. But that's only what our eyes see and our lips taste. Like seeing the sun crash on US 2, our senses will again deceive us. It will look like bread and wine, but it won't be bread and wine. How do we trust this transformation to be true when our senses tell us otherwise? We must rely on the testimony of the expert who said, take this bread, this is my body. Take this cup, this is my blood. Notice that Jesus did not say, take this bread, it will symbolize my body. Take this cup, the wine inside will be a symbol of my blood. No, he said, it truly is. Over the centuries, this teaching has become known as the Catholic Eucharistic doctrine of the real presence. How exactly does this work? Let me explain it this way. After Mass, go down to our harvest dinner. On the dessert table, you'll find little plates, one with two triangles baked of of pastry dough, baked crispy, filled with sweet blueberries. And you'll say, that's a piece of pie. You'll see another plate with two wedges of crust filled with apples and cinnamon, and you'll say, that's a piece of pie. A third plate with savory golden custard on a triangular piece of crust, and you'll say, that's a piece of pie. They all look different, but there's something about each of them that makes them pie. They have different appearances, but at their most basic level, at their essence, They are substantially pieces of pie. Okay, now what if I took a piece of pumpkin pie and I added some non-dairy whipped cream and I bit off a chunk of that pie? You'd say, well, with that big bite out of it, it looks different. Its appearance changed, but it's still pie. 
I've changed the appearance, but the substance remains the same. Even if I were to drop that plate on the floor and it got squashed, if someone said, what's that on the floor? We'd all say, it's a piece of pie. Even though it has completely changed its appearance. That's what normally happens. Appearances change, but the substance remains the same. The Eucharist, however, is unique. At the consecration, the appearances of bread and wine stay the same, while the substance, the underlying thing that makes it bread and wine, that is what changes. It still looks like bread, still tastes like wine, but through the power of Christ's word, the substances change to become his body and blood. That's why we can say it is no longer bread and wine, but truly changed into the real presence of Jesus Christ. It's hard to say at what point the early church started talking about the Eucharist in terms of real presence. What we do know is that very early on, people who did not believe that Jesus was present in the Eucharist, those folks were considered in heresy. As early as the 50s, St. Paul wrote of the Eucharist to the Corinthians. He spelled it out. He wrote, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? If you go back even farther to the first disciples and Jesus himself, if you read chapter 6 of John's Gospel, Jesus pounds away at the notion that he is the bread from heaven to be eaten. Listen to some of what he said. I am the bread come down from heaven. The bread I give is my flesh for the life of the world. If you do not eat this bread I give you, you will not have life within you. My flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. If you eat this bread, I will raise you up on the last day. There doesn't seem to be any question in Jesus' mind about what he's trying to say here. This was not symbolic talk. This was Jesus at his most literal. Know what happened the day that he told his followers that he was the bread of life? The gospel says that many of Jesus' disciples walked away because the teaching was too hard. So if he meant, I am the bread of life, metaphorically, and the people got their signals mixed, he could have easily paused at any point and told the crowd, hey guys, wait up. This bread of life thing, I just meant it symbolically. Don't get so upset. But Jesus doesn't back off. He goes all in. And because of it, he lost most of his church that day. It's actually very simple. If Jesus were speaking symbolically about the Eucharist, why would the teaching have been so hard to accept? But that's the point, isn't it? Many disciples have turned away then and through the centuries precisely because the Eucharist is difficult. The very resistance of the disciples to the bread of life teaching implies that the crowds understood Jesus as we Catholics understand him today. Jesus meant every word. My flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. That's what we hold in faith. It's a lot to think about, isn't it? When we're celebrating the consecration, there's no way we can take it all in. It's just too much. Wouldn't it be great if we could stop the Mass so that we could think about everything that was going on? Wouldn't it be fantastic if we could just say freeze when the priest is holding the host above the altar? We'd be like that man in the Gospel we could kneel before Jesus, worshiping, thinking about the great gift he's given us. It would be awesome if we could have the time to give thanks as we adore the presence of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Friends, this is exactly what we do during our parish holy hour. On Fridays at 3 p.m., 
the Holy Eucharist is brought out from our tabernacle. It's placed in a special vessel called the monstrance. And then that is placed on the altar. It is that moment of worship, frozen for an hour, giving us time that we wish we had during Mass. I want to encourage everyone to consider taking time for adoration. Join us on Fridays at 3 o'clock for our holy hour. Just try it. Once again, the gospel today can be our model. We can come before the Lord like the ten lepers. We can call out and ask for him to show us mercy. And what do the scriptures tell us happens? It says, Jesus sees them and heals them. I guarantee you, if you come to Holy Hour, you too can be overwhelmed by the presence of God in Jesus. Again this week, I've shared a lot with you. But friends, I'm not here to prove something. But I am here to invite you to imagine something wonderful that you cannot see. I'm inviting you to rise up from being trapped in a world of appearances to surrender what is truly real. But you have to make that choice. As a family looked into the cages at the local animal shelter, they saw all kinds of dogs, big, small. One was so furry that they couldn't tell the front end from the back. But in one of the cages, they found a scared three-month-old puppy that had been abused and abandoned. They just knew this was the dog for their family. As they carried it to the car, the puppy kept trembling in fear. How were they going to get that dog to trust them? Here's how. Once they got home, they put the puppy on the doorstep. They went in the house, but they left the door open. And from inside the house, they called out, Come on! Come on! At that moment, the puppy was faced with a choice. He could either remain outside alone in a dangerous world, or he could heed the unseen, tender voice calling him from within. After a few mo moments of hesitation, the puppy began inching through the doorway. And with that, they instantly became friends. The puppy stopped being suspicious and skittish. He even became playful and affectionate with people. And all because he dared to approach the presence that beckoned him from the darkness. Jesus is the true presence of God that beckons us. He calls out to us from the altar and from the tabernacle. Come on, come on. Make the choice and believe.